thank all of you for tuning in. Uh, now, I'm still getting used to giving online uh, history talks over things like WebEx, so please bear with me. I apologize in advance for any technical glitches. I'm glad uh, that uh, I have Zoe here to help, uh, and hopefully between us we'll be able to uh, uh, get through any hurdles. Now, back in early May, I gave a presentation on John and Elizabeth Simcoe, and at that time, there seemed to be interest in having a talk dedicated just to Elizabeth. So that is what I prepared for this evening. I'm not sure if anyone who is attending tonight also listened in on my talk back on May the 7th, but if you did, uh, I apologize if any of tonight's content uh, in some format may seem a little familiar. Uh, I feel that a lot of people may only know of Elizabeth Simcoe mostly through her husband, John Graves Simcoe, who served as the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada from 1791 until 1796. And this is a time when most history, either here in Upper Canada or anywhere around the world, has traditionally been written by and about men. Uh, this seems unfair because Elizabeth Simcoe deserves to be celebrated in her own right. Uh, when she traveled through the Canadian colonies in the 1790s with her husband, she chose to do things that practically no other woman or wife or mother would have done at the end of the 1700s. Most of them would have stayed at home in England drinking tea, sewing or playing cards while their husbands traveled around the world and went about the business of setting up the British Empire. Elizabeth Simcoe recorded her five-year journey through the Canadas by making hundreds of paintings and diary entries. And her work offers us a rare and incredibly unique glimpse of what life uh, uh, was like in uh, the southern parts of Quebec and Ontario 200 years ago, which is why I believe her accomplishments deserve to be so much better known. Tonight, I plan on sharing some of the history that she recorded in her own words and pictures. Now, my talk should last about 40 minutes, uh, and there will be uh, time for you to save any questions or comments until the end. So let's begin our look back at the life of Elizabeth Simcoe. And of course, she wasn't known as Elizabeth Simcoe until she got married uh, to her husband. Her maiden name was Elizabeth Osuma Gwillem. Elizabeth's father, Thomas Gwillem, played a part in Canadian history. He was British military officer who became an aide to the legendary General James Wolfe, whose death at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham has been commemorated in paintings and has become the stuff of Canadian historical legend. Thomas Willem survived the battle on the Plains of Abraham and the fighting in North America, but he was then dispatched to do battle in Germany, and he was killed in action early in 1762. Manor House that I've shown here was the ancestral home of the Gwillem family, uh, located in the village of Whitchurch in Herefordshire. When Thomas Gwillem left here for the last time before going off to die in battle, he had no idea that his wife, Elizabeth Spinks, was pregnant. It was a surprise for her too. She was 38 years old and had never had any other children. The strain of giving birth to a daughter all by herself was too much for her, and she died soon after childbirth. Elizabeth, the mother, was buried at the Gwillem family's grave enclosure at St. Dupricia's Church in the village of Whitchurch. Elizabeth, the daughter, was baptized at the same church on the same day that her mother was laid to rest. This is a sketch of the Gwillem family tomb at St. Dupricia's Church. The tragic circumstances around Elizabeth Gwillem's birth and the death of both her parents to her rather unusual middle name of Posthuma, from Posthumus, and she grew up uh, after the death of both her parents without ever knowing either one. But fortunately, young Elizabeth had other family members who helped her out. She eventually became the ward of her mother's sister, her Aunt Margaret, and Margaret's husband, Samuel Graves. Elizabeth's Aunt Margaret and Uncle Samuel lived in the Black Down Hills region of the county of Devon in southwest England. Elizabeth fell in love with the beautiful Devonshire landscape. She started making sketches and paintings like this one as she roamed through the rolling countryside. She spent a lot of time on walk, long walks and rides on horseback, capturing the countryside as she went. Eventually, Elizabeth was distracted from her artistic pastimes when a young gentleman came to stay with her aunt and uncle in 1781. Elizabeth, who was now 19 years old, found herself spending more and more time with a young man who was now sharing her aunt and uncle's estate. This young gentleman was, of course, John Graves Simcoe. He was born 
in a village called Cotterstock in England on February the 25th, 1752. This made him a full 10 years older than Elizabeth Gwillen. Simcoe's father was an officer in the Royal Navy when, who died of pneumonia on board his ship, HMS Pembroke, in May of 1759 during the British campaign to take Quebec. Young John was only seven years old when his father died, and like Elizabeth, he knew what it was like to lose a parent. This is a portrait of an 18-year-old John Grave Simcoe painted in 1770 when he enlisted in the British Army. He eventually went off to fight in the American Revolution uh, and rose up through the ranks. Simcoe's mother, Catherine, had died in 1776. Well, he was off fighting here in North America. When Simcoe went back to England after the war, he went to stay here at an estate called Hembury Fort House. The estate was set in the Blackdown Hills on the border between Somerset and Devon. This was the home of Simcoe, uh, Simcoe's godfather, Samuel Graves, and it was, as I've mentioned, Samuel Graves and his wife, Margaret, who were uncle and aunt to young Elizabeth Gwillem. Elizabeth Gwillem soon caught John Simcoe's eye. The couple started spending time together. They had both lost their parents and had no siblings, but they soon found happiness in one another's company. John Grave Simcoe was a popular and gallant military hero. He was also quite tall, and according to some accounts, he stood a full six foot two inches tall. At 29 years old, his early adulthood had been full of adventure, but he also had a future full of promise. <coughs> Elizabeth was a decade younger. She was 19 years old, pretty and slight, standing about five feet tall. She was intelligent. She could paint and do needlework. She could carry on an intelligent conversation in English or French or German. The brave military hero and the pretty young debutante started taking walks through the black down hills together. At first, they were always chaperoned by Elizabeth's aunt, Elizabeth's aunt Margaret, the Admiral's wife, who was skeptical of the blossoming young romance, mostly because of the 10-year age gap between John and Elizabeth. At first, Margaret also worried that John was only interested in Elizabeth for her inheritance money. But soon, she started letting them walk out on their own. They would go on long horseback rides or meandering trails through the local countryside. Elizabeth was short enough that she had to trot every few steps to keep up with John Simcoe's long-legged stride. Love had its way, and on December the 30th, 1782, John and Elizabeth made the short trip down the hill from Hembury Fort House to the Church of St. Mary and St. Giles in the tiny village of Buckrell. The Simcoes were married in front of their friends and their few surviving family members, and Elizabeth Posthuma Gwillem was now Elizabeth Posthuma Simcoe. The couple used Elizabeth's inheritance to buy an estate of their own called Wolford Lodge, which was nearly right around the corner from Hembury. They would go on to raise a family of their own and live out the remainder of their lives in the very same hills where they'd first met and fallen in love. Except, of course, for the five years that they spent living here and founding the town that eventually became Toronto and the province that grew into Ontario. When John was appointed Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada on September the 12th, 1791, he and Elizabeth left England almost immediately. Elizabeth Simcoe actually kept at least three versions of the diary that she recorded her Canadian travels in. The first contained brief entries that she recorded almost on a daily basis, which were often combined with rough illustrations. This extract, for example, includes her description and illustration of some caterpillars. Uh, this first version of her diary is the one that I've mostly used for my presentation. Elizabeth Senko and her husband John were joined on their journey by the youngest two of their six children. These included two-year-old Sophia, born in 1789, and a son Francis, who had only been born earlier in 1791. Elizabeth Sinko and her family boarded their ship, HMS Triton, set sail for the Canadas on September the 26th, 1791. In her diary entry for that day, Elizabeth noted that it was windy, but fine and clear. She wrote of how she became giddy, which meant that she was seasick. As soon as I entered the ship and went to my cabin, an apartment just large enough to swing a cot. 
Elizabeth Simcoe made these sketches of the islands off Nova Scotia and the coastline along the St. Lawrence River. She wrote of how, when she went up on deck, the weather was so rough that I was obliged to hold fast to a cannon. And yet she wrote that she quite enjoyed the thoughts of the long journey we have before us and the perpetual change of scenery it will afford. Elizabeth's diary records how on October the 29th, 1791, ship approached the Strait of Canso, which divides the peninsula of Nova Scotia from Cape Britain Island. She rendered this painting of Isle Madame, an island on the southeastern corner of Cape Britain Island. She described it as a bold and perpendicular dark red rock, shaded almost to black and covered with pine trees. This is Elizabeth Simcoe's painting off the Isle of Entry, one of the Magdalena Islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. She wrote of how going down the St. Lawrence affords the most delightful scenery, whether it uh, be between Kingston and Montreal, among the number of wooded islands of all sizes, or the woody, rocky shores, bordering the rapids and the transparent, clear waters. Elizabeth produced this wash of watercolor showing a bend in the St. Lawrence River in 1792. She wrote of how the scenery of the St. Lawrence River was almost to persuade me it is worthwhile to cross the Atlantic for the pleasure of voyaging on this delightful lake-like river, the setting sun reflecting the deepest shades from the shores and throwing rich tints onto the water. She seemed less fond of Quebec City, at least at first. Now, this might have been because when they arrived in Quebec City on November the 11th, 1791, winter had already started. Remarks in her diary noted how dismal of a town Quebec appeared through the mist, sleet, and rain. The weather forced the Simcoe's to spend the winter of late 1791 and early 1792, mostly around Quebec City. Elizabeth and her husband were entertained in Quebec City, though, by members of local society, and Elizabeth Simcoe's view of Quebec City improved. Uh, they traveled around the nearby countryside to take in the scenery, Elizabeth wrote of riding in open horse-drawn sleighs, which she also sketched. One of the local landmarks that Elizabeth Simcoe found particularly memorable was Montmorency Falls, which was located 13 kilometers or eight miles east of Quebec City. The water of the falls cascades 83 meters or 272 feet into the St. Lawrence River at the mouth of the Montmorency River. This makes for a greater height than at Niagara Falls, Elizabeth described how the river, which dashes, dashes over a very rocky bed among the woods, make the whole scene very picturesque. She painted Wolf's Cove near Quebec City. Now, this is where Thomas Willem, the father whom she'd never known, had landed with General James Wolfe in the British Army before defeating the French at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. It must have been a pointed point in her journey, since her husband John's father died of pneumonia on board his ship just before making it this far. But even though she painted the local seascape as well as this water cascade at Wolf's Cove, her diary held no written reflections on the death of either her own father or of her father-in-law. Perhaps she chose to keep private any thoughts on the premature pass passing of both of these men. As the party passed on, uh, past the Thousand Islands, Elizabeth wrote the different sizes and shapes of these innumerable isles have a pretty appearance. Some of them are many miles in extent, while many of them are only large enough to contain four or five trees. Elizabeth described Kingston as a small town of only about 50 wooden houses and only one house built out of stone, which belonged to a merchant. Uh, at least it had a mill, judging by her painting. She noted that Kingston held a harbor and a small garrison of soldiers who fired off a salute when the Simcoe's arrived. Elizabeth Simcoe spent considerable effort trying to capture the Niagara River or Niagara Falls. Now, this is hardly surprising. People who visit Southern Ontario today still flock to the falls to take pictures over 200 years later. In this painting, she tried to capture a sense of the spray coming off the falls, which she claimed to see rising like a cloud, even from a distance of several miles. She wrote of how the river rushes in the most rapid manner, of how the rapids are a very fine sight, and of how the fall itself is the grandest sight imaginable. From the immense width of waters and the circular form of the Grand Falls, the whole center of the falls is frequently seen as a rainbow. 
Elizabeth Simcoe was clearly enamored of the whole thing. The whole scene was wonderfully fine, she noted. And after the eye becomes more familiar with the objects, I think the pleasure will be greater in dwelling on them. She went on to claim how these scenes have afforded me so much delight that I class these days with those in which I remember to have felt the greatest pleasure from fine objects, whether of art or of nature. She certainly did her best to combine both art and nature together in the legacy of landscape, landscapes that she's left to those of us who can still view them today over two centuries after she made them. Elizabeth and her husband made their first visit to the future site of the town of York, the future city of Toronto, in the summer of 1793. And Elizabeth recorded that her husband, the governor, uh, spoke in praise of the harbour and a fine spot near it covered in a large oak where he intended to build the town. The paintings that Elizabeth uh, made in York show the very first images that anyone ever produced of what would eventually be Toronto. This painting shows the view along the waterfront, looking towards the foot of Bathurst Street, where Fort York and then eventually the Gardner Expressway would be built. In the spring of 1794, the Simcoe started building a summer home overlooking the Don River Valley, near where Parliament and Bloor Streets are today. The design of the home was inspired by a Greek temple, but it was built out of wood with stripped pine trees serving as the columns that ran around the outside of the house. The Simcoe's called this home Castle Frank. The castle part was supposed to make it sound as though it, were more, it was more grand than it really was. And Frank was for their five-year-old son, Francis. Castle Frank was abandoned when the Simcoe's went back to England in 1796. And it was used by squatters <coughs> who used it to hunt and <clears throat> to fish along the Don River until it was accidentally burned to the ground uh, in 1829. And of course, today, uh, the site is somewhere a few hundred feet uh, south uh, across the street from Castle Frank subway station. Simcoe has explored the lower end of the Don River quite extensively when they were here. In fact, they were the ones who called it the Don River because it reminded them of the River Don, uh, the same name back in England. This was Elizabeth Simcoe's painting of the view looking west from the mouth of the Don River back in the 1790s. Even after the Simcoe's went back to England, the Don River continued to be a great natural barrier running through Toronto. But Elizabeth Simcoe painted this image of the very first bridge over the Don River, which was made out of trees and logs that were tied together. Elizabeth Simcoe painted this cabin, which was on the Don River near Queen Street. It was the home of a man named John Scatting, who became Simcoe's estate manager at Wilford Lodge back in England. And uh, when they came here together, Scatting uh, became Simcoe's aide de camp. Now, I have one last stop that I want to make with you in following the Simcoe's around the Toronto area. On August the 4th, 1793, Elizabeth uh, wrote how she came within sight of what is named on a government map, the Highlands of Toronto. The shore is extremely bold uh, and has the appearance of chalk cliffs. They appeared so well, that we talked of calling the area Scarborough. These were, of course, the Scarborough Bluffs. Now, a lot has changed since the Simcoe's were here in the 1790s, but these Scarborough Bluffs were obviously every bit as impressive a natural feature then as they are today. And like the Don River, Scarborough still bears the name given it to it uh, by John and Elizabeth Simcoe. Elizabeth Simcoe documented several types of flora and fauna that she encountered uh, encountered on her travels through the St. Lawrence River and through Upper Canada. Her and her husband uh, also displayed the stereotypical fondness for pets that has long been a virtue of the, uh, the English people. She painted this butterfly that she saw in Montreal in 1792. She's rendered two studies of the same specimen, which she described as being as black as rich velvet. This was a snowbird that she painted in Quebec in December of 1791. Her natural paintings show an attention to detail, and many of her illustrations document the ecological history of Quebec and Ontario. In a letter that she wrote to a friend back in England, she described life in Lower Canada as a new chapter in her life. Elizabeth painted this view of the harbour of York and then the foot of Bathurst Street in 1793. When the Simcoe's first arrived in the area in the summer of 1793, they were joined by their pet cat, 
they'd adopted him in Niagara. And when he joined them in the town of York, he became what many historians believe to be the first house cat to set paw in what would become the future city of Toronto. She wrote about the family's pet cat in her diary. She said, I brought a favorite white cat with gray spots with me from Niagara. He is a native of Kingston. His sense and attachment are such that those who believe in transmigration would think his soul once animated a, reason, a reasoning being. He was undaunted on board the ship, sits composedly as sentinel at my door amid the beats and drums and the crash of falling trees and visits the tents uh, with as little fear as a dog might do. The Simcoe's also acquired a pet dog in Niagara. They called him Jack Sharp, and he was a big uh, companion, loyal companion. Jack Sharp belonged to a very Canadian breed of dog called Newfoundland. Uh, his canine ancestors had been living on the island of Newfoundland for hundreds of years. Extracts from Elizabeth Simcoe's diary tell us how Jack Sharp could be prone to getting himself in trouble. He made enemies with a local raccoon on one occasion, and on another, he fought it out with a porcupine and got a neck full of quills for his trouble. In September of 1794, John Simcoe was exploring a lake that French explorers had called La Hocle. Simcoe renamed it Lake Simcoe after his father. Uh, as they turned south, uh, Simcoe and his party back towards Toronto, they started to get lost. Uh, food ran short, and over the next few days, they started to think of ways to avoid starving to death. Uh, and some members of the party started to cast hungry looking glances toward Jack Sharp, Simcoe's big Newfoundland dog. The group spotted Lake Ontario and the settlement at York just in time. Salvation was at hand and Jack Sharp was saved from being eaten. Everyone devoured their next meal with gusto, but if Jack Sharp had any notion of what had nearly befallen him, he was probably the most grateful of all. Elizabeth Simcoe sketched this portrait of an Ojibwe chief in 1794. She was fascinated by Indigenous people and often wrote about them. Uh, in one meeting with members of the Mississauga people, the Simcoes were presented with what Elizabeth described as the largest land tortoise I've ever seen. According to her diary, they spent the next evening dining on a fine dish of what she described as tortoise ready dressed. Now, Elizabeth paintings of New York and around Upper Canada certainly show off how rugged the landscape was. Her and her companions often had to get creative just to survive. An entry on, in her diary on uh, November the 20th, 1793, uh, tells us how autumn was turning into winter and food was probably running a bit scarce. She wrote, we dined in the woods and ate part of a raccoon. It was very fat and tasted like lamb if eaten with mint sauce. And sometimes it seems like raccoons have become Toronto's unofficial animal mascot. Uh, but these days, I think probably, uh, most of us probably wouldn't consider actually eating one. Elizabeth Simcoe sometimes wrote of the vivid dreams that came to her when she had trouble sleeping. It's no wonder that she had the occasional rest light, uh, restless night. Uh, for a lot of the time that she traveled through Upper Canada with her husband, their only shelter was a large canvas tent that had once belonged to the famed explorer, Captain James Cook. Elizabeth Simcoe made this painting in July of 1793, and it shows the tents that were used at Queenston Heights. The um, Simcoe's tent wasn't really a tent by our modern day standards. It was nearly seven meters or 22 feet by four and a half meters or 15 feet, and it was made from canvas that was stretched out on a wooden frame. The tent could even be partially boarded up in colder weather. Elizabeth mentioned the tent in her diaries, uh, writing how she had taken the canvas house we brought from England for my own apartment. It makes two very comfortably and remarkably warm private rooms. She also noted that it is boarded outside to prevent snow lying on it. But there were other reasons why Elizabeth Sinko might have had troubling dreams. Although the American Revolution was technically over and done with, the situation was still very tense. Uh, most people expected an American invasion at just about any time. And the American Revolution had inspired an even bloodier and more terrifying uprising in France. The French Revolution was in full swing during the summer of 1793 which was exactly when the Simcoe's were setting up the town of York. The reign of terror would start that autumn. French aristocrats 
losing their heads to the guillotine by the cartload, and the newly established French Republic had declared war on the British Empire. This is a painting that Elizabeth Simcoe made on August the 27th, 1793. It shows British ships firing off their cannon in Toronto's harbour to salute the fact that John Graves Simcoe had officially proclaimed the town of York into existence. The French King Louis XVI was beheaded by the guillotine on January the 21st, 1793, just a few months before the Simcoe set up the town of York. His 37-year-old wife, Marie Antoinette, lost her head to the guillotine in October of 1793, less than two months after the town of York was established. But news of this regicide took several months to cross the Atlantic and reach the Simcoe's here in Upper Canada. They finally learned the fate of the French royal couple on March 1st, 1794. Elizabeth Simcoe wrote in a diary of the news received of the death of the Queen of France. The Simcoe's had planned on hosting a dance that evening, but it was canceled out of solemn respect. Elizabeth wrote of the orders given out for mourning in which everybody appeared this evening. Just four days later, on March the 5th, 1794, Elizabeth wrote more about growing anxiety. She dreaded the Americans and their French Republican allies and the possibility of an attack on Upper Canada. A week later, she recorded a terrifying dream in her diary. She wrote, I dreamt sometime since that the governor, her husband, Mr. Talbert, who was her husband's secretary, and I were passing a wood possessed by an enemy who fired ball at us as fast as possible. It was, I was so frightened that I have never since liked to hear a musket fired, and I'm quite nervous when I hear the probability of this country being attacked. So Elizabeth Simcoe documented her nightmare in which her and her husband were running through the upper Canadian wilderness being shot at by unseen enemies who were hiding in the forest. This too gives us more of an idea of what Toronto uh, was like 200 years ago. A lot of the land that became our city was covered in dark forest that made a perfect hiding place for a dreaded and murderous enemy. Elizabeth Simcoe wrote about another episode set in the forest of Upper Canada. Although this, although this particular account had a dreamlike and nearly surreal quality, it actually took place in real life. While well, she and her husband were in Kingston at the beginning of July of 1792. On Saturday, July 7, 1792, she wrote of how she walked this evening in a wood lately set on fire by some unextinguished fires being left by some persons who had encamped there, which in dry weather often communicates to the trees. She continued, perhaps you have no idea of the pleasure of walking in a burning wood, but I found it so great that I think I shall have some wood set on fire for all of my evening walks. The smoke arising from it keeps the mosquitoes at a distance, and when the fire has caught the hollow trunk of a lofty tree, the flame issuing from the top has a fine effect. In some trees where but a small flame appears, it looks like stars as the evening grows dark and the flare and smoke interspread in different masses of dark woods has a very picturesque appearance. So it was that Elizabeth Simcoe, who could walk through a burning forest fire with a perfectly self-possessed sense of calm, had nightmares about being shot in the woods by American revolutionaries or French Republicans. As it turns out, she had ample enough reason to worry about being ambushed by a dreaded enemy. When the Simcoe's finally left the Canadas in July of 1796 and tried to sail out of the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, French warships were waiting for them. Their ship escaped, although the French sheets, uh, some other English vessels, Elizabeth Simcoe talked about hiding below deck with her children, and how she was in perfect misery every moment, expecting to hear the guns fire, as I had no idea what it was to be so frightened. Some refreshment was sent, but I could not eat. I played at backgammon and cards, which tranquilizes my mind, but it will be a great while before I recover my fight. But after weeks sailing back across the Atlantic, the Simcoe's did eventually make it back to England. John Graves Simcoe was given a few other appointments, but his health was declining and he died in Exeter in England on October the 26th, 1806. He was 54 years old. Elizabeth was 44 years 
years old. And when her husband died, she lived as a widow for another 43 years and three months before dying at their home at Wolford Lodge on January the 17th, 1850. Painting remained one of her greatest distractions, although she also evangelized for the English church and spent a lot of time surrounded by her children. Elizabeth Simcoe's marriage had been a fruitful one, and she bore a total of 11 children. There were eight daughters and three sons, who I've shown here on this genealogical chart. She wrote about finding herself often in that way, as she put it. Her first five children were daughters, but finally the son and heir that she longed for was born in June of 1791. This was Francis, who, along with her, her sister Sophia, uh, joined his parents across the Atlantic. It was this Francis uh, for whom Castle Frank was named. Lieutenant Francis Willem Simcoe was killed in action on the 6th of April, 1812, at the Siege of Badajoz in Spain. He was 21 years old. The siege became an infamous event in the British fight against Napoleon. The British army accrued about 4,800 dead or wounded, and when they finally stormed the fortress, they went on an uncontrolled rampage. Many British soldiers broke into homes and taverns, stole alcohol, got drunk, and took out their revenge on the local inhabitants. It took three days for the unruly troops to be brought back into line. Meanwhile, Francis Simcoe was buried on the battlefield where he was decently interred, as Elizabeth wrote in her diary. On January the 16th, 1793, Elizabeth Simcoe gave birth to her seventh child. This was Catherine Simcoe, uh, who came into the world in Niagara in the middle of a Canadian winter under the shelter of the Simcoe's large canvas tent. Young Catherine Simcoe became one of the first European children to be born in the province of Upper Canada. A little over a year later, in the spring of 1794, Elizabeth Simcoe was back here in the town of York while her husband was off traveling through Niagara. Young Catherine Simcoe, who was only 15 months old, went into what Elizabeth described as fits and spasms. And uh, young Catherine died the next morning, Easter Monday, April the 21st, 1794. Catherine was laid to rest in the military cemetery that John Simcoe had established at what is now Victoria Memorial Park at the southeast corner of Wellington and Portland Streets. Catherine Simcoe was in fact the first person to be buried in the newly consecrated cemetery. Another 400 people were eventually buried there before the cemetery was deemed full in 1863. It was closed and neglected for years. Eventually, only 17 of the 400 graves survived. Uh, and although these uh, 17 have now been restored, uh, Catherine Simcoe's uh, is sadly not amongst them. This is a sketch that Elizabeth Simcoe made of her son, Francis. He was obviously a favorite, and she mentioned him in her diary several times. Uh, although she mentioned Catherine in a few letters back home, there was no mention at all of Catherine's birth or her short life or her passing uh, written in Elizabeth's journals. Similarly, Elizabeth made far fewer diary reference to her husband, John, who she always called the governor, than one might imagine. She also hardly ever wrote about her other daughter, Sophia, who had also come to Canada. This is a picture of Elizabeth Simcoe in her later years. She became domineering and dictatorial as she aged, especially towards her daughters. She wouldn't even let them sit down in her company without permission. Uh, Elizabeth's word became family law. She never approved of any of her daughter's suitors and forbade them to marry. They mostly stayed home and cared for her until she died on January the 17th, 1850, at the age of 87 years old. Only the youngest Simcoe daughter, Anne, got married, and this was after Elizabeth Simcoe died. Anne was 49 years old at the time of her wedding, and apparently her surviving sisters all agreed that she'd married beneath her station. None of them attended Anne's wedding, but she outlived all 10 of her siblings before dying in 1877 at the age of 73 years old. Only one son survived to maturity, and this was Henry Addington Simcoe. None of his siblings ever had children, largely due to Elizabeth's prohibition on her daughters getting married. So it was up to her son, Henry Addington, to carry on the family name. Uh, one of Henry Addington Simcoe's great-great-grandsons, through his eldest daughter, Anne Eliza Simcoe, 
was a man named Arthur Henry Linton. So he was a great, great grandson of Elizabeth and John Grave Simcoe. Arthur Linton wasn't born with the Simcoe surname because the Simcoes were his maternal ancestors. But he adopted the Simcoe family name, adding it to his own and becoming Arthur Henry Linton Simcoe. His reason for doing this was a straightforward one. He wanted to inherit, and he ended up getting Wolford Lodge. I mentioned Wolford Lodge earlier. John Graves uh, and Elizabeth Simcoe had built it for themselves back when they got married back in 1782. Wolford Lodge was mostly destroyed by fire in the early 1920s, and Arthur Linton Simcoe sold it off, sold off the estate in 1923. Uh, a brand new Wolford Lodge was built in 1929 in a style that was meant to duplicate the old lodge that the Simcoe's had built. It's a hotel now, uh, set in the countryside of the Blackton Hills, an area that is still winning awards for its natural beauty. This is Elizabeth Simcoe's painting of the family chapel that the Simcoe's built in their estate. The Wolford Chapel was consecrated in 1802. When the rest of the Wolford estate was sold off, there was a risk that the chapel might have been lost, but fortunately, it was uh, not included in the real estate transaction of 1923. A wealthy English publisher by the name of Sir Geoffrey Harmsworth bought the Wolford Chapel, and in 1966, he transferred uh, the deed for the chapel to the province of Ontario. The chapel and the grounds are kept up by a local charity, but the property is quite literally uh, the property or territory of the province of Ontario. The Canadian national flag flies over the chapel. It has an Ontario heritage plaque and it serves as a small piece of Canadian history found in the beautiful Devonshire countryside. There are small memorials like this one along the outside of the church which commemorates various members of the Simcoe family. This is the memorial for Elizabeth Simcoe. The grave sites of Elizabeth's husband, John Grave Simcoe, as well as those for some of the couple's 11 children, are also nearby. Architectural legacies notwithstanding, I feel that Elizabeth Simcoe's greatest gift to us has, uh, has been her paintings and her diary entries. Her paintings and sketches were constant diversions through her widowhood, especially when she took trips through southwest uh, England and through Wales. She openly admitted, though, that the five years she spent in the Canadian colonies were the most exciting in her long life of 87 years. She'd enjoyed it all, the rough crossing of the North Atlantic, the society life she found in Montreal and Quebec City, and even life living under a canvas tent out in the rugged bush in Niagara or in the fledgling little town of York here in Toronto. The value of Elizabeth Simcoe's illustrations lies not so much in their merit at art, as artwork, but in the fact that they give those of us here and now in the 21st century a sense of what Canadian history actually looked like more than 200 years ago. One of Elizabeth Simcoe's major motivations in producing her art was to serve as a documentarian. She once wrote, I took no sketch of a place I never wish to recollect. She was intentionally making a pictorial record of what she saw. As for her diary, copies of it have alternately been published, then gone out of print, and then been rediscovered and printed again over the years. The most extensive version that I've read was published in 1911 with really helpful notes and copious annotations by a Toronto journalist and historian named John Ross Robertson. This was the version of Elizabeth Cinco diary, uh, diaries that I used uh, for today's talk. If any of you are interested in learning much more about Elizabeth Simcoe's work uh, or travels than I can present in just 40 or 45 minutes, I would highly rec recommend her diary. Were it not for Elizabeth Simcoe's work, we would have no idea what Toronto's harbour looked like in the 1790s. We wouldn't be able to compare the quiet tree-covered shoreline with the unimaginable contrast of the 21st century lakefront that we have today. We you wouldn't have any idea of what the early settlements at Montreal or Niagara or Kingston or the wilds that surrounded them looked like without Elizabeth Simcoe's work. These were then and are now important places in Canadian history, and she's helped to preserve, preserve their history for us. Uh, in fact, whenever I give a talk on Elizabeth Simcoe, I'm constantly amazed at how much she's left for us to talk about over 200 years after she visited 
early Toronto and Upper Canada. Uh, once again, I feel like I have only scratched the surface, but I feel like I must have been talking for uh, at least uh, 40 minutes by now. Uh, so perhaps this is a good place for me to conclude. Uh, thanks again for having me. I'm going to try to exit out of my PowerPoint uh, and uh, we'll go into the, uh, the chat feature, feature which uh, Zoe can moderate and uh, for, uh, have the questions and answers.